This is the first in a series of sessions that will deal with high frequency or RF devices. You'll be introduced to the basic principles of RF communications, which will set the stage for subsequent sessions. We'll start this session by covering the fundamental principles of RF communications, then cover many of the most common specifications and parameters involved in defining and evaluating RF communication systems. Radio frequency, commonly abbreviated as RF, is defined as a frequency in the range of 3 kHz to 300 gigahertz. Although any signal at that frequency range could be designated as RF, in practice we generally don't do that for just any high-speed signal. For instance, a clock feeding a microprocessor often falls into the RF frequency range, but we don't call that an RF signal. The term RF implies a communication signal or system where information is transferred from one point to another. The information being transferred is usually an analog voice signal, digital data, or some type of control signal. Another term often used synonymously with communication systems is the term wireless. In most cases, RF communications do operate wirelessly, where the transmission medium is open air. However, that is not a requirement. Many RF communication systems are linked with physical wires. As long as the system is used for some type of communications and it operates at a frequency between 3 kHz and 300 gigahertz, it is accurate to describe it as an RF communication system. RF systems utilize a signal that is called the carrier signal. The frequency of that signal is called the carrier frequency. The carrier signal can be loosely thought of as the wire that connects the communication points. AC signals generate electromagnetic waves, and those waves are launched into the air by the transmitter. Those waves travel through the air and can be picked up by a receiver. This is what forms the communication link and serves as a replacement for the wires that are used in a hardwired system. However, while emitting the carrier signal does establish a communication link between the transmitter and receiver, that signal alone doesn't transfer any information. To do that, the information to be transferred must be somehow encoded onto the carrier, a process called modulation. The concept of the carrier signal is pretty simple. It is just an AC signal at a set frequency. However, there are a multitude of modulation techniques, ranging from very simple to very complex. We won't go into modulation techniques in this session, except to give an example. Perhaps the simplest modulation method is called on-off keying, abbreviated OOK. OOK modulation is used to transmit binary data, or zeros and ones. To transmit a zero, the carrier is turned off, so nothing is transmitted. To transmit a one, the carrier is turned on. The smoke signals in this picture are an example of OOK. No smoke is a zero, while a puff of smoke is a one. Of course, it's unlikely that in this case the Indians are communicating in binary, but are instead using their own scheme. Perhaps three short puffs means it's time for dinner. OOK is the simplest modulation method and very easy to understand, but is only used in the simplest applications like remote control of lighting. Considerably more complex modulation schemes are used in modern high-speed systems such as cell phones and Wi-Fi. Several factors are considered when selecting the carrier frequency and modulation method. For most applications, that choice is dictated by regulatory bodies like the FCC and their counterparts around the world. Finally, as we all know, we live in the real world. As a result, the design of a communication system 
must consider factors such as noise and other interference, obstacles, atmospheric conditions, as well as the distance between the communication points. The two basic components of an RF communication signal are the carrier and the information being sent. The carrier is a constant frequency AC signal, which establishes the link, while the information sent is modulated onto the carrier. Just as in the case of the Pony Express, both the rider and the information he carries are essential for communication of a message. The same is true for RF communications. Both the carrier signal and the information modulated onto it are necessary. Amplitude modulation, abbreviated as AM, is another form of modulation. In AM, the carrier signal is multiplied by the information being sent. In the diagram to the right, the information is a binary signal, perhaps ranging between 1 volt and 2 volts. When both signals are fed into a modulator circuit, the resulting output is the waveform at the bottom. The signal is launched into the airwaves and is picked up by the receiver. In the receiver, a process called demodulation occurs where the carrier signal is stripped away and the digital information is extracted. In this case illustrated here, the information is binary data. This data could be as simple as a short message in Morse code or as complex as the pixels in a video signal. However, note that amplitude modulation works equally well when the information is an analog signal such as a voice or music signal, and the process and circuitry is nearly identical. Most of us are familiar with viewing signals in the time domain, such as what we see when looking at a signal using an oscilloscope. We can observe the amplitude of multiple signals displayed on the vertical axis against time along the horizontal axis. The waveform can be analyzed for properties such as amplitude, rise and fall times, amplitude changes between intervals, signal distortion, and other aspects of interest. Fourier analysis tells us that any complex signal is composed of a sum of sine waves of different amplitudes. You've already discovered that a basic communication signal consists of the carrier frequency combined with an information signal. You'll soon learn that other signals some of them undesirable, also get mixed into the single waveform. It is much more useful to view and analyze these signals in terms of the amplitudes of their component frequencies, which is called the frequency domain. This is the way signals are displayed when viewed on a spectrum analyzer. The plots on this slide are examples of viewing the same three signals. On the left is a display of the signal amplitudes versus time, which is the time domain representation. This is what we would see if we fed those three signals separately into three input channels of an oscilloscope. However, most of the time, these signals are combined into one composite waveform. The plot at the bottom shows all three waveforms summed into one, similar to what you might see when a signal has been modulated onto a carrier. Can you tell what you're looking at when you view that bottom waveform? However, if we view that composite signal on a spectrum analyzer in the frequency domain, it is easy to determine what's going on. We can see the amplitude of each component of the signal as well as its frequency. You won't give up your oscilloscope when working with RF. However, you'll find that in many situations, viewing signals in the frequency domain on a spectrum analyzer provides much better information. This includes tasks such as analyzing the behavior of filters, determining the quality of an oscillator, and examining harmonics, noise, and other sources of interference. Finally, as you view the rest of the slides in this and subsequent presentations in this series, you'll note that very few of the plots you'll see will be in the time domain. Instead, nearly all are in the frequency domain. 
As discussed on the previous slide, it is often easier to view signals in the frequency domain. Similarly, it is generally better to do most of the design work in the frequency domain as well. Writing equations and performing analysis of RF communication systems can be very difficult when using time-based equations. This is accomplished by using a technique called Fourier transformation. The first step in doing this is to convert the time-based equations into frequency-based equations using Fourier transforms. Then, the frequency-based equations can be solved using simple algebraic operations. Finally, the results are converted back into the time domain using inverse Fourier transforms. Unless you recently graduated from engineering school or routinely do RF work, then you have probably forgotten a lot about Fourier analysis. Fortunately, software and hardware tools such as MathCAD and MATLAB are available. These tools automate many of the tedious steps and greatly simplify the design and analysis steps. Electromagnetic waves are the foundation of RF communications. These waves are emitted from the transmitter and picked up by the receiver. Even a small length of wire is capable of picking up an RF signal. However, unlike hardwired communication systems, which transfer nearly all of the transmitted signal to the receiver, a link using electromagnetic waves incurs considerable signal loss when traveling from the transmitter to the receiver. One of the best ways to increase the range of a communication link is to replace a small piece of wire with an efficient antenna. Antennas can increase the signal strength, both at the transmitter and the receiver. Received signal strength is roughly proportional to the area of the antenna. A larger antenna with more area will capture more of the available power, producing a stronger signal for the receiver. The transmitter also has an antenna. A small point antenna, which is a theoretical standard, spreads the electromagnetic waves and associated power in all directions over a large area. This allows any receiver within range to pick up the signal, despite its location and orientation with respect to the transmitter. However, since the energy is uniformly spread in a spherical pattern around the transmitter, the signal strength will diminish with the cube of the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. As an alternative, the transmitter's antenna can be designed to focus the electromagnetic wave into a directional pattern aimed at the receiver. This can result in substantially higher signal power at the receiver, although this does impose limitations on transmitter and receiver placement. Antenna design is a science in itself, and a good antenna can make a major difference in overall system performance. This slide pictures a number of examples of antennas, each optimized for the characteristics and goals of each particular situation. Their varying sizes and shapes are a result of optimization given the characteristics of the signals. Factors such as frequency, bandwidth, coverage, power, and cost all come into play. From the top left to bottom right, the antennas shown are mini antenna for RF tag, interior TV receiver antenna, outdoor TV antenna, GSM base station, diverse parabolic antenna, and GPS geostationary antenna. The two basic functions in a communication system are transmit and receive. The system in the diagram at the top is a simple one-way communication channel which contains one transmitter and one receiver. The system in the bottom diagram is a two-way communication channel which can send information in both directions. When a link can both transmit and receive information, it is called a transceiver, which is a simple combination of the words transmitter and receiver. Transceivers can operate in two different modes, called half-duplex and full-duplex. 
when a two-way communication system is half duplex, information can only flow in one direction at a time. For example, from the left transceiver to the one on the right, or vice versa. Most two-way radios are half duplex. As soon as the button on the microphone is pressed to begin speaking, the receiver section shuts off and communication from the other party is disabled. If it has been designed to support it, a two-way communication system can operate in full duplex mode, meaning that information can flow in both directions at the same time. Telephone systems operate full duplex. The parties at both ends can speak and be heard by the other party simultaneously. Shown here is a block diagram of a typical RF transceiver. Examples of systems that implement a configuration similar to this include a GSM phone, an automobile remote tire monitoring system, a GPS navigator, and a remote access gate. All these examples include most of the basic functional blocks here, including low noise amplifier or LNA, mixers, VCOs, PLLs, PAs, modulators, demodulators, and power detectors. These functional blocks might be standalone building blocks, or some or all of them might be integrated onto one IC. Even though similar blocks inside each type of transceiver perform the same basic function, the performance and complexity of each implementation can differ dramatically. These differences are a result of overall system performance and operating environment for each application. Performance is dictated by many factors, including link distance, noise, information bandwidth, power budget, and so on. This diagram appears on the Maxim website. When that diagram is viewed online, the blocks drawn in dark blue are hyperlinks to a list of Maxim devices which offer that functionality. Each function in the diagram has a specific purpose, much like the engine, transmission, and brakes have in an automobile. For example, the low noise amplifier, or LNA, serves the purpose of amplifying weak signals coming from the antenna. Since those signals are at very low levels, it must provide amplification while adding as little internal noise as possible. The down converter mixer plays the role of translating the carrier frequency, which can be at a frequency in the gigahertz range, down to a frequency on which the other blocks can operate. This lower frequency is called an intermediate frequency, or IF. VCO is the acronym for voltage controlled oscillator, and PLL is short for phase lock loop. The combination of these two blocks generate the reference frequencies used by the other blocks. Certain blocks tend to influence specific performance factors more than others. For example, the quality of the VCO and PLL have a significant influence on performance characteristics, including distance, information bandwidth, error rate, and power consumption. The text in dark orange indicates the performance parameters that are strongly influenced by the associated block. As seen in the RF front-end diagram, each basic RF function has a specific role to play in the RF communication chain. The LNA amplifies very weak signals from the antenna, the modulator encodes the information onto the carrier, and the PLL generates the correct frequency to the antenna. For the remainder of this session, we'll focus primarily on two elements, RF amplifiers and mixers. By discussing these two functional blocks, we'll cover nearly 50% of all the basic RF devices. RF amplifiers is a broad category and includes LNAs, power amplifiers or PAs, buffers, and variable gain amplifiers or VGAs. When we discuss mixers, we'll cover both up converters and down converters. 
Note that in some architectures, mixers perform the modulation and demodulation functions. RF devices have many of the same specifications that other lower frequency devices such as op amps have. These include specifications for power supply voltage range, temperature range, and so on. However, RF devices have several additional specifications that are important in addition to those. Most of the key specifications for RF devices are listed here in the lower section of the bulleted list. It is essential to have an understanding of many of these specifications in order to speak the same language as the RF designer or developer. Information signals, whether they are voice, video, data, analog or digital, they all occupy frequencies or a frequency range. The width of the frequency range they occupy is called the signal bandwidth or baseband. Generally the baseband starts at DC and spans the range up to the maximum frequency in the signal. This is the bandwidth occupied by the information being conveyed and corresponds to the contents of the letter being carried by the Pony Express rider in the graphic on an earlier slide. The baseband plot shown in the frequency domain can exhibit a variety of shapes depending on the structure and density of information. Shown here are two examples of actual baseband signals as shown on a spectrum analyzer. RF carriers often transmit information in channels, somewhat in the way that cars use routes and highways. Channel width is like highway or route size. The larger they are, the more cars that can use them simultaneously. In RF, the channel width indicates the number of carriers or frequencies that can be transmitted through the channel. The channel width is measured in hertz and is often called bandwidth. The channel width must be at least as wide as the bandwidth of the information being transmitted through that channel. Another parameter associated with channel width is the gap between channels. These gaps serve as a margin to keep the data in two adjacent channels from interfering with each other. This gap is called channel spacing and is also measured in hertz. The definition and specifications of channels and their distribution throughout the spectrum is often fixed by the authorities such as the FCC. Examples of this include the channel frequencies, spacing, and gaps for the GSM and ISM bands. Adjacent channel power ratio is a measure of how well the signal in one channel is attenuated in the adjacent channels. It is generally best practice to maintain a guard band as margin between the assigned channels. The certification and regulatory entities verify this parameter and others before allowing the product to be placed on the market. The chart on this page is only readable when viewed online at a much higher magnification than we can show on this slide. What it shows is the entire RF spectrum beginning at 3 kHz and spanning to 300 gigahertz. Each horizontal strip displays one decade of frequencies. For example, the top strip displays the frequencies starting at 3 kHz, then up to but not including 30 kHz. The second strip shows the frequencies between 30 kHz and 300 kHz, and so on. Each strip is divided into blocks of varying sizes. Each block is labeled with the name of the service or services that have been assigned to that block. These services include maritime communications, amateur radio, radio and television broadcasting, cell phone bands, and so on. These assignments have been agreed on by a variety of international authorities including ITU, CEPT, FCC, and BEREC, all groups that handle spectrum allocation. Note that with the exception of the very lowest band, 
every block is occupied by one or more services. While the chart is nearly impossible to read on this slide, it is easy to conclude that the RF spectrum is a limited resource. It's a fact of life in the real world that the environment, as well as the components we design with, are sources of electrical noise. Dealing with this noise is especially important when designing RF communication systems, since the signal levels entering a receiver from the antenna are at very low power levels. Even a small amount of noise will degrade the signal and potentially corrupt the communication. In order to design a system and consider the aspect of noise, we need some way to quantify it. The most common way to do that is to use a specification called the signal to noise ratio, or SNR. In simple terms, the SNR is the ratio of signal power to the power of the noise. Since most signal chain calculations are performed using decibels, this ratio is often converted to that form by taking the log of the ratio and multiplying that by 10. It's not possible to improve the signal-to-noise ratio of a signal. Once noise has contaminated the signal, you can't get rid of it. You might be able to eliminate the noise surrounding your signal, but you cannot get rid of the noise in the same frequency range of the desired signal. For that reason, the SNR at the output of a signal chain will never be better than the SNR at the input. When a signal is amplified, the noise present in the signal is amplified by an equal amount, so the SNR remains the same. The best that can be done during signal processing is to make every effort to minimize adding additional noise. Unfortunately, it is a fact that all components, both active and passive, do generate some level of internally generated noise. For this reason, the LNA, or low noise amplifier, is a key component on the signal chain. These are especially important at the input stage where the signal is very weak. At this point, the signal can be amplified to levels where subsequent stages that generate higher levels of noise will have a lesser impact on the SNR. Of course, the LNA will add some amount of noise, but that is held to a minimum by careful design of the amplifier. Therefore, use the lowest noise components on the input stage. Amplify the input signal before any other processing is performed, and keep in mind that the SNR can never improve from input to output. As we saw on the previous slide, the SNR of a signal can never improve and will generally degrade as it passes through the signal chain. Two figures of merit are used to quantify the extent to which a component adds noise to the signal and degrades the SNR. Noise factor, abbreviated as F, is the ratio of SNR in to SNR out and provides a quantified indication of how much that component will degrade the SNR as the signal passes through it. Since SNR in is always equal to or higher than SNR out, F is always greater than or equal to 1. The noise figure, abbreviated as NF, is the same ratio but expressed in decibels. This is easily derived from the noise factor by calculating NF equals 10 times the log of F. Most of the time, it is more convenient to work with signal levels, gains, and losses in terms of decibels. That allows signal chain calculations to be simple additions and subtractions. As you delve further into communication system design, you'll find this to be the norm, and working with common parameters and calculations in terms of decibels eventually becomes intuitive. When the information sent through a communication link is in digital form, the speed of the data transmission is measured in bits per second and is called the bit rate. When considering the bit rate, it is important to understand the distinction between gross bit rate and net bit rate. Gross bit rate refers to the total number of bits transmitted per unit time, 
generally expressed in bits per second. The total number of bits includes not just the bits which comprise the useful information, but also the overhead bits required by the transmission protocol. These extra bits include start bits, stop bits, and error checking bits. These extra bits are necessary for the data transmission process, but are discarded at the end of the receiving chain. Therefore, the net bit rate is often lower than the gross bit rate. A symbol is a packet of bits, and symbol rate is the number of symbols that a system can transmit and receive per unit time. Symbols are associated with more complex modulation schemes. Simple modulation schemes like on-off keying, discussed in a previous slide, only encode one bit into each change made to the carrier. In that case, the carrier is either turned on or turned off to signify either a 0 or a 1, which results in one bit of information. More complex modulation schemes modify the level and phase of the carrier in discrete steps on each transition which allows multiple bits to be encoded into each transition. Each transition is considered to carry a symbol and again each symbol contains multiple bits of information. In many applications where the information being sent is digital there is no minimum bit rate requirement. Sending a PDF file is an example. The only requirement for bit rate in that case is that it needs to be sent fast enough so that the recipient doesn't lose patience, which is a fairly arbitrary measure. However, most of the applications on this list are media oriented and require the communication channel to support a specific minimum bit rate to operate. This table shows the data rates for some of these applications. A bit error occurs when a transmitted bit is corrupted at some point in the communication chain. This could be due to noise, interference, distortion, or data synchronization errors. The rate at which these errors occur can be quantified and is expressed as the bit error rate, or BER. BER is the number of bit errors divided by the total number of bits transferred. BER does not have any units associated with it and is often expressed as a percentage. A lower BER number or percentage indicates a more reliable communications channel. A question that every system designer must ask is, what level of BER is acceptable? The answer depends on factors specific to the application. A digital audio or video signal will function acceptably with a fairly high bit error rate as long as the minimum data rate is maintained. In contrast, even the loss of a single bit in a payment system could be catastrophic. In cases like this where data integrity is essential, methods of data error detection, correction, and redundancy are generally implemented. While some combination of these measures can ensure reliable communications, the overhead they impose can have a negative impact on the overall net data rate. As we've discussed, the SNR specification provides an indication of the quality of the communication channel. However, it doesn't really tell us if a communication channel is acceptable for data communications. For example, in a channel with a low SNR, remember, higher SNR is better, Transmitting at a fairly low data rate might produce an acceptable bit error rate. However, transmitting at a much higher data rate, even if the SNR is very good, could result in an unacceptably high bit error rate. Bit error rate depends not only on the signal to noise ratio, but also the modulation scheme and data rate. Certainly, the bit error rate will be high when a channel has a low signal to noise ratio. A bit error rate of 10 to the negative 6 means that only 1 in 1 million bits will be corrupted. The worst bit error rate is 1, which is 100% corrupted bits. The ideal case is a bit error rate of 0, which is no errors. 
Linearity is an important specification for nearly all RF devices. The graph here shows the transfer function for an amplifier. Input power is on the horizontal axis, and output power is on the vertical axis. In the ideal case, which is shown by the red line, output power rises linearly with input power, regardless of either the input or the output power. The gain of the amplifier is equal to the slope of the line. However, a real amplifier at some point will begin to saturate and the gain will taper off. The plot of a real amplifier is drawn as the blue line, and you can see where the gain begins to taper off towards the top right of the graph. This behavior is quantified by a specification called the 1 dB compression point. That is specified as the input power level, which results in an output power level that is 1 dB lower than the level predicted by the ideal red line. The 1 dB compression point discussed in the last slide is a global measure of the nonlinearity. This nonlinearity also causes other effects in the form of unwanted frequencies that are generated when the amplifier begins to saturate. If the input signal, or baseband, contains only one frequency, then additional signals will be generated which are harmonics of this frequency. A harmonic is a signal which occurs at integer multiples of the original frequency. In this case, the harmonics will be produced at two, three, and four times the frequency of the baseband signal. Since there is a lot of separation between these unwanted harmonics and the baseband frequency, they are fairly easy to filter out. However, if the input is composed of several frequencies, or a band of frequencies, the nonlinearity due to amplifier saturation will create harmonics at all integer combinations of the original frequencies. In addition, all these frequencies combine with each other and produce even more signals, which are called intermodulation products. The primary consideration is the location of all these additional signals in the frequency domain. Unwanted signals that are far away from the baseband signals are easy to eliminate with simple filters. However, unwanted signals that are very close to the baseband signals can be very difficult to eliminate, requiring complex and expensive filters. IP3 is a specification that can be used to predict the level of these unwanted signals versus the useful signal power. IP3 is an important concept, but it is also a fairly complicated one. So we'll wait until later to discuss this further. This takes us to the conclusion of this first module on RF. Hopefully we've given you a little background on the subject and prepared you to investigate this topic further in the subsequent modules. For more information on this topic, please go to our website at www.maximintegrated.com under Products, Communications, Wireless and RF. We hope you enjoy this video and see you again in another educational video of Maxim Integrated.